All right, welcome everyone. Uh, today we're going to be talking about um, systems genetics. So in the previous lecture we talked about um, genetics at the single locus level. Right now we're going to be looking at genetics at the systems level. So first of all we're going to review what we saw last time and uh, <laughs> what happened right after uh, Zoom crashed. Uh, we're going to talk about GWAS, fine mapping, Bayesian variant prioritization, and also deep learning methods for GWAS for calling SNPs and also for prioritizing functional SNPs. Then we're going to talk about EQTLs and mediation, finding the intermediate molecular phenotypes of disease. Then we're going to look at linear mixed models or LMMs and how they're extremely useful for genome-wide association studies and for EQTLs for expression quantitative trait loci. Then we're going to look at polygenic risk scores, basically how do you sum over many, many variants. And then we're gonna to move to heritability. So first of all, define uh, heritability. We're gonna look at multiple definitions. Then we're gonna talk about missing heritability. And we're gonna, then we're gonna talk about how we partition heritability. Then we're gonna look at a very fast way of both calculating heritability and partitioning heritability, namely LD score regression or LDSC. And then we're gonna finalize with polygenic and omnigenic disease models. Talk about cores and periphery and then how that applies to disease gene networks. So the common theme today is going beyond a single locus view of genetics and looking really at the whole systems um, uh, level. So first of all, uh, recapping what we talked about last time. So uh, genetics started with Mendelian disorders. These are largely driven by one or a few genes and then uh, has recently moved to polygenic disorders and that has been the huge power of genome-wide association studies where we can discover many, many variants of small effects. And these are mostly non-coding in contrast to Mendelian disorders, which are mostly protein coding. <coughs> we saw a major complication of genome-wide association studies and their interpretation, which is that common variants or SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, live in haplotypes. They are co-inherited so all of these genetic variants sitting in this very, very large block over this very large segment of the genome are in fact inherited as a block largely. And therefore, if you have, you know, CGG, you can uniquely define a haplotype that they live in and predict all of the other variants without having to uh, observe them directly. So this is a blessing because you can uh, carry out uh, genome-wide association studies across hundreds of thousands of individuals by only genotyping a small number of SNPs. The challenge, however, the downside of it, it occurs because uh, when it comes to figuring out which of these genetic variants is actually the driver, you now have dozens and sometimes hundreds to choose from. And that's the challenge of fine mapping and that's the challenge of dissecting the function of non-coding uh, genetic associations. Namely, finding what tissue and cell type they act in, what target gene they act through, what are the causal nucleotides, what are the upstream regulators, what are the cellular phenotypes, and what are the organismal phenotypes. And last time we saw how these apply to the FTO locus, enabling us to find the driver variant, the upstream regulator, the downstream target genes, and the pathways that they switch between. And the advantage of doing all these exercises is that we can now start manipulating these variants. And that's, where, that's how we can actually start reversing disease phenotypes. And that's very much the goal. So how do we uh, carry out systematic genetic studies to then interpret these studies using everything that we've learned throughout the course based on RNA and epigenome transcription uh, and epigenome profiling in both healthy and disease samples, and then integrating all these data using these deep learning models and then validating the predictions, of course. So what does that tell us? What we, when we're looking at the overlap between these epigenomic annotations and these chromatin states that we talked about from the Roadmap Epigenomics Project with genetic information from dozens of traits, what we're finding is that genetic variants associated with these traits tend to localize in specific tissues that are actually highly disease relevant based on the literature. This is exciting. It basically tells us that we can now start using this information to figure out the networks within which these traits are acting, how they relate to each other, and what tissues they appear to be affecting. If you look here, for example, in brain, you see this 
clustering of intelligence, cognitive performance, but also schizophrenia, neuroticism, et cetera, associated with uh, enhancers that are active in brain. If you look at heart, you find coronary artery disease and all kinds of heart rate uh, associated functions. If you look at immune traits, you again uh, sort of find that they're localizing in immune cell types and so on and so forth. So that allows us to now start learning something global across these hundreds of uh, disease associated loci. We can start even partitioning complex traits such as coronary artery disease into all of the tissues that these genetic variants are associated with. And this partitioning is in fact an enabling us to now start dissecting the distinct gene ontology terms and the distinct comorbid traits that these loci are associated with. So we can take very complex traits and effectively split them into their simpler parts. And there's been a large number of Bayesian methods for doing this. The concept is the following. You basically look at your epigenomic annotations and how they overlap genome-wide association uh, hits. You then find what are the epigenomic annotations that are enriched in your uh, GWAS hits. And then you use the enrichment as an empirical prior, which is effectively derived from the data, but genome-wide, to basically find what are the annotations that are repeatedly across many different regions associated with the disease. And then when you go into any one individual locus, any one individual association, you can basically take all of the genetic variants that are associated and prioritize those that land within the annotations that are also enriched in the rest of the genome. Raise your hands if you're with me on these concepts. Yes, awesome. So that basically means that we can combine the GWAS evidence that we see with a prior that is learned empirically across these enrichments to then infer the probability that a given SNP is causal, which basically combines both the evidence that comes from the genome association, association studies, the evidence that comes from the linkage is equilibrium and the relationship of that SNP with other SNPs in the locus, and also the evidence that comes from the empirical prior that we learned globally. So using that, we can now start uh, applying it to different traits. If you apply this method to Crohn's disease, what you're finding is that the enriched annotations are very much localizing in immune pathways, and that allows you to prioritize a different set of SNPs. If you look at schizophrenia, you find that the uh, genome-wide hits are localizing in the central nervous system, and that again allows you to now prioritize a different set of SNPs than what you would otherwise. And we've used all kinds of validations to basically show that based on evolutionary conservation, based on EQTLs and digital genome footprints of DNA accessibility, and also the ability to drive gene expression, that these prioritized SNPs are in fact much more likely to be functional than the original uh, GWAS uh, variants. We can also use this to start prioritizing new loci. So we saw these Manhattan plots earlier, which are wonderful, and we saw how some of these sub-threshold hits sometimes rise above significant, genome-wide significance threshold, and sometimes disappear altogether as we increase the sample size. But what if we could use these epigenomic enrichments to now start prioritizing these SNPs here in the twilight zone that are not quite genome-wide significant, not, not quite at 10 to the minus 10 times, five times 10 to the minus eight, but they are, you know, their p-value is at least more significant than 10 to the minus four. So indeed, we have shown that you can combine these epigenomic annotations and all kinds of other annotations to basically prioritize genetic variants in the subthreshold loci. And that when you go in and actually test them experimentally, you see that indeed they lead to phenotypes when you find the target genes associated with these new loci that were not previously genome-wide significant, you find that indeed they are just as functional as uh, these genome-wide significant loci when tested experimentally. So there's a lot of power in using these global signals to then prioritize uh, individual loci. Raise your hands if you're with me so far. Yes, awesome. 
Um, all right, so this is basically GWAS fine mapping, namely looking at these large regions of linkage equilibrium and then using Bayesian methods and specifically empirical priors based on the genome wide enrichment to prioritize variants within these regions. So in addition to these Bayesian approaches that basically use the global signal, you can also find a large number of deep learning approaches for both calling variants in the first place based on the sequencing evidence and prioritizing functional variants among them. So uh, CAD is one of those uh, methods that basically uh, trains a classifier using a large number of features such as conservation of genomic modifications, functional predictions of motif disruption or, or amino acid changes, and the genetic context to then distinguish in a deep learning classification kind of way uh, neutral variants from deleterious variants. Actually, sorry, this is not deep learning, this is a traditional machine learning. And it's basically training a logistic regression model that scores the variants and uh, eventually based on the sequencing continents for each of those variants and these annotations allows you to then uh, provide a global score which indeed prioritizes with quite uh, significant uh, accuracy um, ClinVar variants that are annotated as pathogenic. And there's a large number of these methods for variant prioritization. So CAD is using this ensemble variant effect predictor with protein level scores and DNA scapper sensitivity, GC content, as well as evolutionary conservation. Um, and FUNSEEK, for example, is using inter and intra species conservation, loss and gain of function events, as well as enhancer gene links. Um, REM is using the uh, pro potential of non coding variants to cause Mendelian diseases if mutated. And Orion is basically uh, looking at an independent set of annotations and features, and then again predicting Mendelian mutations. And there's a large number of uh, models that have been used for those. Graphical models, support vector machines, Stephen Markov models, random forests, and so on and so forth. So again, this is um, a very well-established field, and it's something where you can easily uh, combine existing methods with a cool new deep learning architecture and sometimes challenge uh, the state of the art. But that's for predicting variant functionality. What about calling the variants in the first place? So GATK is the pipeline that was developed uh, at, the, at the Broad Institute, the Genome Analysis Toolkit, for specifically calling haplotypes and, and calling variants. And it's uh, a quite um, extensive method that combines many, many different approaches. It uses a logistic regression to model the base errors. It uses a hidden Markov model to compute read likelihoods. It uses naive base classification to identify the variants. And then it uses a Gaussian mixture model with handcrafted features to filter likely false positive variants capturing common error models. So many, many years of work went into making uh, this uh, caller uh, both accurate and fast. And the question is, you know, could a student or could a new team go and actually challenge the very state of the art for variant calling? Um, well, on one hand, there have been uh, uh, technology-specific methods, for example, for exomes in particular, there have been new methods that basically train these logistic regression classifiers using training data from the exome project, true positives, where uh, the mismatch was also discovered in other projects, and then true negatives with the remaining reads. And then the features are, you know, the mismatch quality, the flanking quality, whether neighboring nucleotides were swapped, and so on and so forth. So enter deep learning, and basically the Google team uh, over at Verily, led by Mark Dupristo, uh, basically developed this deep variant uh, approach for calling both SNPs and small indel variants using deep neural networks. So the idea here is that you're again training based on aligned reads and the reference genome. You basically have the raw images uh, of these variants, and then you're basically using this strained convolutional neural network to basically predict the likelihood that a given variant is functional or not. And basically they train those in several uh, training cycles with stochastic gradient ascent, and then they evaluate the reference reads, the actual images of the bases, 
and they put all of that into a convolutional neural network that then calls variants. And what you can see is that the variant is actually uh, you know, outperforming uh, GATK, which is quite remarkable given how much hand tuning went into that. So it has a, a smaller number of false negatives, a smaller number of false positives, and so on and so forth. So this is kind of a very exciting. It basically says that you could actually train a general purpose deep learning model, even for highly specialized tasks, such as uh, variant calling. We already talked about deep bind uh, earlier when we we're talking about convolutional neural networks for regulatory genomics. And this has been used extensively for actually predicting the pathogenicity of mutations by being able to score these convolutional filters in trained cell types with new sequences that might contain previously unseen genetic variants, as well as the novel variants that are only found in that person and in no one else. And again, this was trained in a large number of previously known motifs, which basically form its convolutional filters. So uh, Deep C was specifically trained, as we talked earlier, uh, to recognize the differences between uh, reference and alternate alleles in their functionality using a large number of these features. And again, these are only two examples of a very large number of convolutional neural networks for DNA binding prediction. So DANQ is this hybrid convolutional and recurrent deep neural network for DNA sequences. BASET, we talked about uh, in one of the lectures, it basically looks at accessible genome uh, prediction using this multitask learning convolutional neural network with multiple cell types. Uh, deep bind and deeper bind, these are uh, the initial, this is the earliest uh, deep learning model, and this is the deeper version of that, deep motif. And then there's also methods for predicting enhancers, 3D interactions, cis regulatory regions. So PEDLA, DEEP, and FIDDLE, which are basically, again, integrating these functional genomics uh, evidence using these deep neural networks, specifically for uh, DNA methylation, deep CPG, and variant calling, uh, calling uh, as I mentioned, deep variant, but also deep LNC, DAM, and deep C. So all of these models are basically only the tip of the iceberg, and there's more and more methods uh, achieving that now. Any questions so far? All right, so um, raise your hands if you're with me so far. Yes, awesome, good. Um, so this is basically annotating variants based on the genomic coordinates of that variant and the specific variant identity without any information about what actually happens to the gene expression profile or to the epigenomic profile in individuals that actually carry that variant. However, we can actually go and carry out these epigenomic profiles and these RNA profiles, not only in reference uh, samples, but also specifically in uh, samples that are varying across individuals in order to study the effect of these common genetic variants on uh, these intermediate phenotypes, on uh, gene accessibility, on histone modifications, on gene expression levels. These don't necessarily need to be the disease individuals. These just need to be individuals who carry the same mutations. And because these mutations are common, if you sample a thousand individuals, chances are you're gonna find individuals that carry these intermediate molecular phenotypes. So that's the challenge of EQTLs, or expression quantitative trait loci. So the goal is to bridge the gap between genetic variation and disease, instead of going from genetic variants, which are extremely polygenic, all the way to disease. Uh, and that takes hundreds of thousands of individuals to catch all of those you know, significant variants. And uh, you know, requires you know, a lot of statistical power. What we could do is actually break up that path with intermediate phenotypes, go and specifically you know, profile the heart and the brain and lung and blood, and sort of trace the impact of these genetic variations on uh, individual uh, enhancer elements, individual genes, and even interme intermediate endophenotypes in order to paint the path of causality to disease. Everybody with me so far? Yes? 
The challenge, of course, with these methods is that disease itself might actually be acting on the gene expression rather than just genetics. So we don't have this unidirectionality that we usually have from genetics as soon as you look at the relationships between these intermediate phenotypes and all of these errors that do not involve genetics are basically bidirectional errors because they're correlation, not causation, because the environment might be affecting both or disease might be affecting these intermediate phenotypes. So how do we overcome this challenge? Well, we are going to develop new statistical methods for actually doing that and for evaluating causality. But first of all, let's focus on QTLs, so quantitative trait loci. So the idea of QTLs is just like you can carry out a genome-wide association study from genetics all the way to disease, you're now going to look at genetics to any of these molecular phenotypes. This could be epigenomics, this could be transcription, and so on and so forth. So we basically carry out the same um, uh, association, only instead of using categorical uh, values, like this person has the disease or doesn't have the disease, we're using a quantitative trait, namely what is the expression level of that gene, or what is the DNA methylation of that locus, and so on and so forth. Raise your hands if you're with me on this one. Awesome. So in the same way that we can carry out GWAS, we can also carry out an MWAS, or a methylome-wide association study, or a TWAS, a transcriptome-wide association study. This is basically looking at the correlation between these intermediate molecular phenotypes and disease. And again, this doesn't give us causality because the causality could be flowing the opposite way. But we can combine these two methods in a very interesting way. We can basically say, let's take QTLs and use them to predict methylation from the genetics. So we're going to impute methylation or we're going to impute transcription. And then we can look at the correlation between predicted transcription, namely the genetic component of transcription, and disease. And what's really powerful here is that we can carry this out across many, many more individuals because we only need the genetics of these individuals once we have figured out the methylation QTLs or the transcription QTLs. And then we don't have the full methylation, we only have the genetic component of methylation, which is great because then we get causality back. Any questions so far? Raise your hand if you're uh, with me. Awesome, very good. So if we try that, in this particular case, looking at post-mortem brains from uh, Alzheimer's and non-Alzheimer's individuals, across 700 individuals, we can basically ask what is the level of DNA methylation versus what is the genotype of that person? Do they have AA, AT, or TT in this particular uh, SNP? And what you find is quite remarkable. At birth, in fact, at conception, knowing the genotype of these individuals, I can already predict what their methylone will look like at 93 years of age. This is quite, quite exciting. It basically says that there are tens of thousands of loci where genetics has a lot to say about epigenomics. And you can see here that the significance goes all the way to 10 to the minus 300. Uh, and then the more chronic corrected value is down here at the red line. And you can see that there's very strong associations all the way down uh, here to, the, to this line. So when we do that, we basically find that regions that previously did not have any genome-wide significant hits, so this is 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 8 is above the limit of that figure, are now coming up genome-wide significant by combining multiple SNPs together to predict the um, intermediate uh, methylation or transcription profile. And we can do this across methylation, we can do this across transcription, we can combine multiple phenotypes. And basically, that results in uh, hundreds of genes that are now newly predicted to be associated with disease. Some of them are in genome-wide significant loci in purple, and these are giving us a candidate target gene in these regions, even though in some cases that gene was not previously known. It also gives us a directionality of the effect, whether it's positively or negatively associated with disease, and it also gives us the overall heritability that we capture of that locus based on the size of the circle. And it also gives us the tissue where this is likely acting because that's the tissue that we profile in the first place. So what are the nuts and bolts of carrying out such an EQTL study? 
well, you basically profile your DNA methylation or epigenomics or RNA. You basically you know, do all kinds of QC and filtering. And then you have a measurement of these quantitative traits. Uh, and then you basically have across all of your individuals the level of expression of every gene. You also measure with a genotyping array, SNPs, for these individuals. And then you effectively carry out a linear regression where you're predicting expression as a function of genotype and covariance. And those covariates can be age, gender, population stratification, technical covariates about the experiment, and so on and so forth. And then this is the same type of QQ plot that we saw earlier for GWAS. And you can basically see that it's well calibrated at the beginning. It's the expected p-values are matching the observed p-values when you look at this quantile quantile uh, breakdown uh, as you go down the uh, rank list. And you have this dramatic deviation with tens of thousands of QTLs that are significant. And then you can, of course, annotate and visualize them and interpret them. Raise your hand if you're with me on this slide. Yes? Awesome. So uh, how do we incorporate these covariates? Well, the same way that we had earlier, but now we can also uh, compute the principal components of our genotype, and we compute the expression principal components, and we can compute uh, QC covariates for uh, every single uh, individual. And then we basically ask, can I predict expression from some base level of expression, this is probably the average for that tissue and for that gene, times the effect of the genotype plus some uh, random effect, okay? And now, in addition to this, I can basically add a, a scalar for every one of these additional variables. Everybody with me so far? Yes? So this is now looking at QTLs. This is basically comparing the two alleles of uh, a CC individual, the two alleles of an AA individual, and the two alleles of a CA individual. So again, humans are homozygous. So at every location, we basically have either, sorry, humans are diploid. So at every location, we're either homozygous or heterozygous. And we either have the reference or the auxiliary allele or one copy of each. But QTL analysis is only looking at those extremes. It's basically looking at you know, each individual's average expression without distinguishing the individual reads. But this is not a microarray measurement. This is a sequencing measurement. So we can actually distinguish those reads that came from the C or from the A chromosome within heterozygous individuals. So we can basically look at the overall expression and actually partition it into the mom's allele and the dad's allele to basically look at allelic differences between the two chromosomes in the same individual, in the same cells. Every single cell has either one allele or the other allele. So instead of just looking at total expression, we can actually partition it into allele-specific signals. Raise your hands if you're with me on this one. Awesome, very cool. So, um, EQTLs are mostly using the extremes. Uh, allelic analysis is mostly using the middle, exclusively using the middle. Can we combine the two? The answer is yes. So, you know, Bryce Devane, uh, Van de Gagin has basically uh, created this combined haplotype uh, test, which is basically looking at both the overall read depth uh, and the allelic imbalance to basically uh, fit both a genotype component and an allelic component to this. You can also go a step further and ask, yes, for some locations, we don't have a change between GG, GA, and AA. These are not EQTLs. For other locations, we do. We have GG, GA, and AA, which basically change. Um, and that's an EQTL, that's an expression quantitative trade loss. But there are some locations where you will have, in an unstimulated condition, no effect of the genotype. But in a stimulated condition, you will have a dramatic effect of the genotype. So these are trait conditional EQTLs or response EQTLs, which basically allows us to say, yes, 
maybe when I test a reference tissue, there's no effect, but when I stimulate that tissue, then I see a dramatic effect of genetics. Um, and that is basically very important because disease occurs in highly environment specific ways. And these could be condition on the trait, this could be condition on immune activation, this could be condition on you know, being exposed to the environment or a, a particular age group and so on and so forth. Raise your hands if you're with me on this one. Yeah, good. All right, so everything we've been uh, mentioning has been using these uh, linear models that basically utilize um, all of these causal effects for every, uh, for every genotype. So basically what we're doing is across N individuals, we're predicting the expression or the disease status of every one of those N individuals based on all of the SNPs of that individual multiplied by the effect sizes, the betas or the thetas of each of those SNPs. Raise your hands if you're with me on this one. So this is just a matrix notation form of the linear model that we've been applying all together. So basically we're predicting uh, expression or disease based on the genotypes, the effect sizes, and some random noise model. This is great, but it's missing a very important factor, which is that these random effects don't, th these um, noise, is not individual specific. This noise is a global noise that is the same across all individuals. However, these effects might actually be individual specific. And that's where linear mixed models come in. So you basically have your uh, you know, standard effects from the genotype. And you also have, in addition, a set of random effects that are kinship dependent where individuals who are more related to each other are more likely to share these random effects. So we're adding to our model not only the genotype contribution, but also a covariate distribution of random effects. Raise your hands if you're with me. So that's basically what linear mixed models are. So basically what they're doing is that they're combining the traditional linear model with a random model effect that is individual dependent and that can take information from the covariates of that individual as well as the kinship matrix of relatedness across all individuals in our study. Any we questions? I have a question, Manoli. Are genotype PCs and expression PCs both denoting the population structure? So uh, the answer is um, that all of them can basically go into here. Uh, but population structure is in, a, is in addition to the expression PCs and the genotype PCs could be capturing population structure, but I could also have additional random effects beyond simply the principal components of the genotype matrix. But indeed, the genotype PCs are the most common way of capturing population structure. The expression PCs don't capture population structure, they usually capture experimental or batch effects and so on and so forth. Any other questions? What's capturing the kinship covariance? The kinship covariance basically tells you how related are these, uh, is every pair of individuals. So if you have uh, siblings, this is 50%. If you have cousins, this is uh, 25%. If you have you know, great grandparents, this is you know, one eighth and so on and so forth. So basically the kinship matrix basically tells you um, how related are uh, those individuals? It's basically the pairs of individuals. And then the other question is, what is the uh, I term? So I is the identity uh, matrix. So this is basically just diagonal matrix multiplied by the covariances of all of the pairs of individuals. Other questions? Awesome. Raise your hands if you're with me. Yes. Raise your hand. Oh. Are you guys still there? Oopsie, I think we have connection problems. Um, all right, I am hoping for the best. Okay, yeah? Are you guys back? 
Okay. Uh, one I'm more. Here. Uh, we can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah. Good. Yeah. So uh, why do we need these random effect models? Because there's unknown population structure, which influences many, many SNPs at a time, which then in turn influence the phenotype in a non-locus specific way. So that phenotypic variation is due to both population stratification and the actual association. And the random effects basically allows to decouple the two. So we can basically use this Bayesian approach to estimating this uh, random effect and um, you know, apply this uh, systematically. So this genetic relatedness is basically telling you what is the relationship of the genotypes. And these can be as big as 50% for siblings, but it could be extremely small for individuals that share only a small, small fraction of their uh, genome. So this is basically a joint model of all of the SNPs. And what, we, what, what the field has shown is that these linear mixed models can capture a lot more heritability, even from genetic variants that are not genome-wide significant. And basically, they uh, can capture up to the full set of additive effects of uh, heritability. So there's a lot of methods for estimating that. Residual maximum likelihood, or REMO, is one of the methods that you guys should see. And it basically um, avoids using the full machine learning fit of parameters and instead uses transformed data so that all of these nuisance parameters have no effect. And then in the variance components analysis, like this random effects model, this transformation focuses on the differences and the sum of the variances. And then what's really phenomenal about these linear mixed models is that these approaches work even when we don't know all of the causal variants basically uses the full genotypes without necessarily having to uh, have a set of genome-wide significance uh, variants. So uh, we can basically use these approaches to now uh, carry out EQTL analysis in the same way that we can carry out genome-wide association studies. And what's really cool is that you can do that using simply your LD uh, uh, relatedness of pairs of SNPs rather than only the individual genotypes of those individuals. So if you have genotype level information for every individual, then you can use that to basically predict expression the way that I was describing earlier. But even if you can't have access to the individual, uh, individual level genotypes for every person, Simply knowing the association of those SNPs and simply knowing the LD relatedness matrix, the, 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 sorry, the covariance matrix, the R square matrix of all pairs of SNPs allows you to actually do summary statistics based uh, transcriptome wide association studies based on predicted effects because the relationship is linear because you're basically looking at the combined effect of this SNP and that SNP and that SNP and that SNP, when you actually plug them all in into your linear model, this is effectively a system of linear equations that you can combine according to exactly the R square LD relationship matrix. So that basically means that even if I don't have individual level genotypes, I can still predict individual level uh, effects. So you can basically carry out this linear regression for EQTLs. You basically have the dosage of every uh, SNP. You have all of the observed covariates, and you also have all of these de novo learned covariates, which are together contributing to your expression levels. And of course, there's an additional noise in the individual measurements. So you can do all kinds of extensions to this. You can have a spikes lab prior that allows you to sort of focus on one value while having a smoothness uh, in the surrounding values. You can have uh, collinearities uh, co and covariances, which are not simply orthogonal between pairs of variables. You can capture the population stratification effects. In this particular case, these are the two first principle components of the overall genotype matrix across a large number of samples from Europe. And what you can see is that the principal components of variation are in fact capturing the geography of these samples. Basically, individuals appears, appear to have been migrating um, you know, quite uniformly across this continent. 
And that allows you to now capture the, gene the geographic relatedness based on the genetic relatedness. Uh, you can uh, add these random effects models that we talked about. You can have a sparse linear mixed effect model that is basically enforcing a, sparsi a sparsity uh, on your uh, data using this uh, uh, two-component mixture model with spike and slab. And you can actually uh, find map causal variants using uh, these priors that we talked about, which can be computed em empirically based on the global enrichment. And you can also find map by sort of directly explicitly adding that into your model and you end up with a fine map set of uh, inferences. So there's uh, you know, a lot of ways of carrying out that inference. Exact inference is, per is correct. Uh, it you know, eventually converges, but it has very limited flexibility. Markov chain Monte Carlo are approximate and they're extremely, extremely slow uh, to converge, but variational based methods uh, actually are uh, you know, much, much more uh, flexible. They're much more fast. And, uh, you know, they can finish in these local optima in finite time. And then uh, they, add, they allow uh, an approximation, which is actually deterministic. So we talked about uh, overall GWAS. We talked about deep learning models for GWAS, for calling SNPs and for prioritizing SNPs. We talked about EQTLs and specifically mediation by capturing the intermediate molecular phenotypes of GWAS. And we also introduced linear mixed models for GWAS and for EQTLs that allow you to have both your genotype effects as well as additional covariates, population stratification, and relatedness effects uh, captured uh, explicitly. Um, raise your hands if you're still with me. Yeah, awesome. Um, so uh, let's now use these to now calculate the risk of disease for every individual by summing over these many variants and then switch to using these approaches to calculate heritability and uh, to partition that heritability. So uh, polygenic risk scores, how do we sum over all of these variants and uh, more? So basically the goal is to estimate the absolute risk of each individual by combining both genetic and environmental risk factors for that individual. So basically you have a lifetime uh, absolute risk, you know, initially this could be very high. And then as you haven't uh, yet developed the disease and you grow older and older, that could be, um, you know, um, decreasing as you go. So, and then some high risk individuals will develop it and then low risk individuals uh, will not. So how do we estimate this polygenic risk score? So you basically have across the genome, a beta value, which is basically the log odds ratio uh, of the effect size of every SNP. And you also have the genotype of every one of the SNPs. So all the, the polygenic risk score does is basically sum over all SNPs these effect sizes for which are identical uh, across all individuals. So basically these betas are a per SNP beta. So every individual has the same set of betas because they belong to every SNP, but every individual has a distinct set of genotypes. And you can capture those genotypes based on 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, uh, based on the identity of the reference of the alternate allele, so 0, 1, 2. Uh, or if you want to calculate risk based on an additive model, you basically have uh, 0, 1, 2. If you want to calculate it based on a dominance model, then you have 0, 1, 1. And if you want to have a recessive model, then it's zero, zero, one. Basically, the only way that you get a one is by having both uh, risk alleles. So can we just combine all the SNPs? Well, the problem is that the correlation between uh, all of these uh, SNPs is not zero. Basically, they're very, very highly correlated to, to each other. Moreover, the individual betas are not very trustworthy for any one SNP. And if you only select the genome-wide significant SNPs, you end up with very, very few SNPs. So it's very difficult to actually build an accurate model based on that. So basically the common practice is to actually tune the set of uh, SNPs that you're choosing based on these uh, p-values. So the, the, the concept is within every LD block, instead of taking all of the SNPs, which are very highly correlated with each other, and therefore double counting the risk 
of that individual because this snippet is associated and that is associated and that is associated and that is associated. Basically, the goal is to, number one, choose a threshold of significance. And this doesn't need to be genome-wide significant. You could go all the way down to 10 minus 4, 10 to minus 2 even. And then for every SNP in, that you've chosen, you exclude every other SNP in the same LD block. So that's what we call LD pruning. Okay? Raise your hands if you're with me on this one. Yeah? Awesome. So you can now basically ask, well, how am I doing by tuning this parameter and how, uh, how much heritability do I capture? And what's really interesting is that as you increase the number of SNPs that you're considering from 60,000 SNPs, 200,000 SNPs, to 500,000 SNPs, to the entire GWAS uh, matrix, then your SNP uh, predictability, your SNP-based predictability continues to increase. This is quite remarkable. It basically says that beyond the genome-wide significant hits, there's huge numbers of SNPs that continue to add to your polygenic risk score uh, estimation. So uh, that's basically the, the key idea. So one way is to prune. Another way is to actually directly decorrelate the LD structure. So there's a series of papers that have now uh, basically sought to transform the SNP space to a multi-SNP space. So instead of thinking of one SNP at a time within each LD block, you can now basically think about meta-SNPs. So these meta-SNPs are effectively the principal components of your SNPs that are combining information from multiple SNPs. So you can basically carry out a singular value decomposition of your SNPs within your LD block and then select independent and orthogonal factors or regularize the eigenvalues to smooth out spurious associations. And you do not need much tuning if you use regularization for this. So this is a very cool way of basically not just choosing one SNP and not suffering from the huge uh, multiple counting, but basically instead taking these independent components. So when you apply these polygenic risk scores, you basically see that you can in fact predict uh, the um, uh, you know, uh, impact of genetics on many, many dis different disorders and you actually have uh, quite a robust uh, uh, prediction, prediction function. Moreover, you can combine these genetics only uh, score with additional information from that person. For example, you know, what is their serology saying? Uh, do they smoke or not? And so on and so forth. I see a question in the chat window. What would happen uh, if we include all SNPs without LD pruning? What would happen is that you end up overcounting, so you end up with a highly inaccurate uh, estimate because you're, you know, double counting, uh, you know, the same SNPs over and over again. Just to clarify, is the PRS an indicator of one's risk of having a genetic disorder? Yes. How widely is it currently used in diagnostics? Well, not widely, unfortunately, and the reason for that is that many of the GWASs are still underpowered, but now that GWAS power is continuing to increase and the predictability of these polygenic risk scores is actually becoming quite uh, high, uh, I believe that this uh, is you know, entering now the diagnostic space. Um, so for example, here, between ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease, you can actually flag patients with uh, quite uh, high uh, accuracy when you use all that. So, we basically talked about polygenic risk scores. We've talked about these linear mixed models. Let's now dive into a little bit more math and get into heritability. So what is the definition of heritability? How do we define missing heritability? And how do we partition heritability? So what have we learned from GWAS? We basically learned that there are tens of thousands of loci that are genome-wide significant, but also that we haven't found all the causal loci that the known loci explain relatively little of the phenotypic variance, and that most loci, in fact, affect transcription regulation rather than coding uh, variation. So what we can ask is, are we done? How much remains to be discovered? And the way to get at that is to basically have an independent estimate of the heritability of different traits. 
For example, height is extremely heritable. If I know the height of your parents, I can basically calculate your expected height with very high accuracy. There are other traits that are not uh, highly heritable. For example, uh, I don't know, your um, risk for cardiac disease or your risk for Alzheimer's. You know, I can't simply take the average of your parents and say, okay, great, you're gonna have Alzheimer's. Um, so how do we now ask how much of that trait heritability have we captured from genetics? So let's talk about how we can quantify all this. So first of all, let's look at the overall phenotypic variance for a trait, namely how much does height of individuals vary? And let's try to partition that phenotypic variance across different components. So what we're gonna ask is from the left to the right here, what is the overall variability in phenotype? And how much of that variability in phenotype is captured by genetics versus by environment. For example, with obesity, you know, there's a genetic component, but there's also an environmental component. So we can actually directly quantify the heritability of obesity by asking how much of the phenotypic variants do I explain genetic, okay? So basically we are assuming that the phenotype is a function of genetics and environment. And we're also assuming that there's no gene environment interaction. And therefore the phenotype is simply the genetic component plus the environmental component. So if you have only one causal variant, there's three possible genetic values, zero, one, or two. And the intuition is that the variance of G, uh, the variance due to the genetics is simply the difference in the averages between these three classes whereas the remaining variation is effectively the environment. So V of V is the variance of the phenotype for the same genetic value, okay? Raise your hands if you're with me on this one. Yes, awesome. Good, so let's now start taking the genetic component of your phenotype and split it further. But first of all, let me clarify that if I measure a phenotype less accurately, my heritability estimate goes down. Why? Because I'm basically increasing the noise. So basically, this is the variance of the phenotype. And if I measure the phenotype in a very noisy kind of action, a, 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 a way, there's basically a bigger environmental component. And that environmental component is simply due to uncertainty in the measurement of the phenotype itself. Okay? Everybody with me? This is a subtle point, but basically, Heritability is the ratio between the genetic variation, the, the variation explained by genetics on the numerator and the variation explained, uh, the overall variation on the denominator. And the larger you make that environmental component, the smaller your heritability. So basically, if people say, oh, the heritability of schizophrenia is very low, well, maybe we don't know how to measure schizophrenia very well. And if we had better phenotyping, that heritability component would actually go up. So now let's ignore the environment component, which also includes measurement noise. And let's uh, look at the genetic component only and split it up further into an additive component and a dominant component and an interaction component. So basically let's assume that the genetic component has an additive, a dominant, and an interaction term. And the additive component corresponds to effectively just a linear model where I'm treating every genotype identity as zero, one, or two based on the number of alternate alleles that the individual has, and then just adding up these scores. So we can add more causal variants, and the phenotype you know, will become closer to Gaussian. Uh, you know, with one um, a variant, you don't have Gaussian phenotypes at all, but with even just a small number of variants, you basically get more and more Gaussian, and with a huge number of variants, you get very uh, close to Gaussian distribution. So you could also further decompose interactions. We could include uh, variants due to de novo mutations. Right now, we're only looking at V of G based on common genetic variants. So now, this heritability can be thought of as this ratio of variances. There's the uh, phenotypic variance, which is genome plus uh, environment. 
And then there's the gene and the genetic component, which is the additive, the dominance, and the interaction term. And we can talk about heritability or broad sense heritability as simply the fraction of the phenotypic variants that I can explain based on my genetic variants. So it's variance of phenotype divided by variance of genotype. And that broad sense heritability captures all genetic factors, and that's capital H squared. Narrow sense heritability is only looking at the additive component of your genetics, only the additive effects. And there's a lot of debate about whether additive versus other effects exist in humans. They've been shown to exist in several animal species, but uh, you know, in human, it's still not clear. Everybody with me on this? Yep. All right, so why is this important? Because we can count, quantify the importance of genetics versus the environment. We can learn about genetic architecture. We can ask how many causal variants are there? Where do they localize functionally? What are their effect sizes? What are their allele frequencies? And narrow sense heritability is basically this fundamental parameter that's needed for phenotype prediction. And these are theoretically best possible prediction performance with a linear model. So I can estimate my heritability based on relatedness, namely I can take identical twins, I can take siblings who are not identical twins, I can take cousins and ask how much of their uh, phenotypic variants do they share because of their genetics. And what's really cool about siblings is that I already know that they share exactly 50% of their genetics or uh, you know, exactly 100%. So I can basically quantify very accurately from sibling and from relatedness studies, the genetic effect that I would expect from the entire genome. And now I can start asking how much of that effect am I actually capturing, okay? So in relatives, basically uh, we can relate phenotypic correlations to genotype correlations. We already know that uh, gen genetic correlation is 50%, 25%, 1/8, et cetera. And I can basically ask, well, how related are they? So if two individuals have the same allele, every one of the causal variants, they will have the same phenotype. And this is what we call an HE regression, where we fit a linear regression of phenotypic correlations against genotypic correlations. And we derive the genotypic correlations from family relationships, monozygotic twins, siblings, etc. So using this estimate, we can basically say that the uh, genetic heritability of height should be around 75% if we we're able to capture all of the genetic variants. So now we can basically ask, ask, great, how much of that heritability do we actually capture in the GWAS SNPs? So you, we can build our linear model of genetics as a function of, uh, of the genetic component of variation uh, by taking all of the genetic variants and multiply them by their effect sizes. We can estimate the SNP effect sizes from GWAS. And the variance explained is basically, you know, uh, how much of that variance is basically coming from this, where uh, you can do this with just genome-wide significant SNPs, or you can do this with all SNPs. And what's really interesting is that with 250,000 samples and 700 genome-wide significant loci, some of which only account for less than a millimeter in height, the H square GWAS, which is the heritability captured by this common variant, is only 16%, as opposed to 73% that we would have expected if we, had, if we had captured everything. And this problem, the fact that this heritability that we capture from the GWAS variants alone is a tiny fraction of the overall estimated heritability from siblings, this has been known as the missing heritability problem. Everybody with me so far? Who feels that they're learning stuff? Raise your hand if you feel like you're learning. Yes, good, awesome, good. So there's many, many uh, 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 hypotheses as to where is that missing heritability coming from. Basically, there's an ongoing debate about several possible explanations for many different traits for the missing heritability problem. And this might actually be trait specific. For some traits, there might actually be different answers. So one answer is that there are many common variants of small effects. That basically there are many, many more variants that I will eventually be able to capture.
The second possibility is that there is a large number of unobserved rare variants that actually have large effects. So this would not be here in the GWAS, but some of that missing heritability might actually be due to rare variants that have very large effects that we're simply not capturing in GWAS arrays. Another possibility is that we're using the wrong model assumptions. Uh, basically, there's you know, something wrong with the model. And every one of these you know, many different uh, theories has very different implications for the future of human genetic studies, for how, where we should be going, whether we should be doing exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, genotyping of more individuals, and so on and so forth. There's only a limited budget for the NIH, and we can invest it in different ways based on these uh, missing heritability assumptions. However, there have been a large number of studies that give us some insights as to what actually might be going on with this whole missing heritability problem. And one insight came from partitioning heritability. So in the same way that you can calculate relatedness in the entire genome by looking at all of the SNPs that two individuals are sharing, and that gives you the relatedness of those individuals, instead of doing it over the whole genome, I could estimate relatedness in a subset of the genome. For example, I could estimate relatedness only in chromosome one. And some individuals are more related in chromosome one and others individuals are re less related on chromosome one based on the number of SNPs for which they have the same alleles. Raise your hands if you're with me on the partitioning of heritability. Great, awesome. So basically the numerator is the same is how much of the overall phenotypic variants do I explain? But the denominator now is only subsets of the genome, in this particular case, partitioning by chromosome. What do you notice in this figure? What you notice is that chromosomes one, two, three, four, five, six, et cetera, which are the largest chromosomes, explain more heritability. And chromosomes you know, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, which are the smallest chromosomes, are explaining less heritability. So the larger the chromosome, the more heritability it explains. This is kind of weird. It basically says that genetic variants appear to be partitioned. Causal genetic variants, not just genetic variants, causal genetic variants appear to be partitioned in a manner proportional to chromosome size. That basically argues for a lot of driver variants. And you can go a step further. You can now partition heritability not just by chromosome anymore, but now for every one megabase window. And what you can see is that for some traits, yes, there's a lot more heritability captured in a small one megabase windows. But for traits like schizophrenia, no single one megabase window captures too much heritability. Heritability appears to be spread out almost uniformly across all one megabase windows in the genome. This is remarkable. It basically argues for a huge number of common variants in these loci contributing in a non-random way, in a non-negligible way, to the overall heritability of schizophrenia. It's as if there are thousands upon thousands of segments each contributing to heritability. Everybody with me here? So I can go a step further. Instead of partitioning just by genomic coordinates, I can actually start partitioning by minor allele frequency and basically look at what is the heritability, i.e. what is the, can I change the, geno the denominator to be only driven by common variants or rare variants or extremely rare variants. Or I can change the denominator to be only the genetic variants that sit in um, hippocampus that are, uh, you know, enhancers in hippocampus and so on and so forth. So when we do that, it, it gives us a lot of insights. So we can basically look at the genetic variants associated uh, that, that fall in loci um, that play roles in the immune system or uh, in particular pathways. And what you can see is that the fraction of the heritability that they're capturing varies uh, dramatically. That basically these pathways can be informed from these enrichments, and then these show a lot more uh, heritability. So 
um, we can go a step further beyond that and calculate the heritability that's due to not only SNP sharing, but actually chromosomal segment sharing. Namely, for every pair of individuals, we can trace back not just individual SNPs, but complete haplotypes through the ancestry of these individuals and paint regions of the genome that have been co-inherited. Why is that important? Because there's a large number of rare variants that have been added to these chromosomes in the ancestors of that red chromosome that they both inherited. So even though I only measured common variants, I can say something about the sharing of rare variants that are sitting in the same loci based on the sharing of haplotypes rather than individual SNPs. Raise your hands if you're with me on these subtle points. Yeah, awesome. So that basically uh, led to the realization that in fact, there are even more um, rare variants that are still not profiled within these haplotypes that uh, contribute to heritability. You can also partition heritability by allele frequency, and you can ask, well, you know, if these are the very common, these are the rare, and these are the very rare. And what you see is that most of the heritability actually sits in the common variants, that the rare variants are not capturing that much more heritability. So that basically suggests that the model of extreme polygenicity with very, very weak effects is probably what's at the root of this missing heritability and that we need more uh, individuals. And you can actually now start doing this based on specific annotations. If you look at these annotations that I showed you earlier are enriched in specific traits. If you look at Crohn's disease, you have immune cells. If you look at multiple sclerosis, again, different types of immune cells. If you have uh, QRS uh, duration, which is a heart a repolarization duration, you basically have a heart as the causal phenotype, but which we, uh, as the driver enhancer annotation. But what's really interesting here is that the uh, genome-wide significance is 10 to the minus seven here, 10 to the minus six, 10 to the minus five, 10 to the minus four, 10 to the minus three, 10 to the minus two. So even as you start going to really, really not genome-wide significant loci, the enrichment stays. So that basically suggests that, you know, these extremely weakly associated loci continue to function in common pathways. And we can actually use heritability to partition genetic variants associated with different epigenomic annotations and then ask, are they enriched for specific traits? And if you look at here, uh, you know, HDL cholesterol, you basically see that, you know, DNAs in liver, for example, appears to be one of the most enriched and so on and so forth. You can also start at a partition heritability according to different genomic annotations. So if you look at coding, untranslated regions, promoters, intergenic, intronic, how much of the genome do they capture and how much heritability do they capture? And what you find is that DNA's hypersensitive regions, namely these open chromatin regions that we've been using for both enhancers and promoters, are in fact hugely overrepresented compared to what you would expect and capturing almost 80% of the overall SNP heritability. So that basically says that we should focus our energy on understanding these pre-transcriptional gene regulatory elements because chances are that they explain four-fifths of the heritability of many disorders. Everybody with me so far? Great. So we talked about heritability, the dif different definitions of heritability, and the missing heritability problem, and how we can partition heritability to gain insights. So now I'm going to actually describe a very recent way of computing heritability, which is actually very, very powerful, called LD score regression. So the idea is that if you look at a causal genetic variant, that is randomly thrown into the genome. So these, are, these little red stars are your causal genetic variants. 
And in one simulation, the causal variance falls here and here. In another simulation, the causal variance falls here and here. In a third simulation, the causal variance falls here and here. Okay. Now, if you overlay LD structure on these genetic variants, so these were randomly chosen to be associated with disease, then what you find is that most of the time, genetic variants will land in long LD segments. And when they do land in long LD segments, they will be more likely to be captured by our genome association studies because we are imputing these long LD blocks very accurately thanks to the many SNPs that are within them. And every now and then, much more rarely, my SNP will fall in a very small LD block. And then that SNP, that causal SNP, will have much lower chance of actually being captured in my genome-wide association study. Raise your hands if you're with me on this intuition. Yep, awesome. So that basically means that under this, you know, identically distributed model, this IID model of standardized effect sizes, the longer your LD, the higher your expected chi-square statistic. The more tags you have, the more causal SNPs you will be able to find. And, you know, the way to think about it is that the more shots you take, the more shots you will have at the goal. So simply simulating under this assumption of uh, true association, what you basically see is that I can simply calculate an LD score for every SNP, which will basically tell me how many LD partners does it have. And that LD score actually correlates very, very well with the actual computed chi-square of these SNPs. That basically means that I can use LD score as a way to capture true heritability. By contrast, if I do the same simulation without causal variance under pure drift, then LD is actually uncorrelated to the magnitude of allele frequency differences between populations. And you know, if I do a regression now between LD score and the chi-square, this is basically a flat line, as opposed to this one, which is a very strong correlation, and it basically intercepts at 1.02, whereas this one intercepts at 1.32, okay? So it turns out that LD score can be used as a surrogate for heritability. So I can actually use LD score regression basically a linear regression of the summary statistics against LD score, which basically gives us heritability without access to individual level genotype features. And this is extremely fast to compute and it's extremely uh, powerful. So I can basically calculate my LD score regression estimates uh, directly from the summary data and build a multivariate model of phenotypic variation where basically I have my uh, you know, non-genetic effects for each individual, my, my multivariate effect for every SNP, and then the genotype matrix for each individual, and then the phenotype vector across individuals. And then I can basically calculate heritability in this particular case using LD score regression. So the idea is basically by reverse engineering the summary statistics data, we can actually find these multivariate parameters and infer um, uh, heritability directly from that. And I can basically regress these statistics on the LD score. And I can, in the same way that I was partitioning heritability before, calculate it based on the phenotypic matrix divided by the genotype matrix. I can now do this by partitioning heritability across different uh, functional annotations and across different traits. And what you can see here is that, for example, schizophrenia tends to have much more heritability partitioned in central nervous system, height in connective tissue or bone, BMI, um, HDL, cholesterol, each vary, Crohn's disease in immune and hematopoietic traits, fasting glucose in adrenal or pancreas, and so on and so forth. 
Everybody still with me? So this is basically LD score regression, which is a very fast way of calculating and partitioning heritability. So I hope that you're sort of seeing where this lecture is heading. And basically, we have this incredible contribution from extremely polygenic factors. Let's talk about that directly. So basically, how far down the rabbit hole uh, does, do we go when we start increasing uh, GWAS? So I showed you this slide last time, where as we start increasing the number of cases, we're discovering more and more disease loci. And we've seen how for every one of these disease loci, we now have hundreds of, uh, every one of these disease traits, we have hundreds of loci that are robustly associated and additional thousands that are weakly associated self-threshold. And if you sort all of the SNPs by their p-values and you ask how enriched are they in different annotations, then what you basically see is that the rank continues to be enriched with millions of SNPs as you go down this association. So that basically says that a huge, huge chunk of the genome is likely contributing to that heritability. Mon cœur, mon amour, et Nora est là, elle te veut. Welcome to social distancing. Schools are closed, daycare is closed. I apologize for that. All right. <laughs> so how far down the rabbit hole do we go? So again, looking at many, many different traits, you continue seeing this enrichment continuing all along. And what has been proposed is this omnigenic model of heritability. The idea is the following. If you look at many, many different traits, not all traits, but many, many different traits, you basically see that the p-values continue to be deviating from the null you know, all the way down to one almost. I mean, you know, 10 to the minus eight is basically at the zero. 10 to the minus seven is still at the zero. And here, this is a linear scale. This is basically going all the way to one. So this is basically uh, leading Jonathan Pritchard and colleagues to basically propose a model where as we start going deeper and deeper into GWAS, what we're gonna be finding is that every SNP in the genome is basically associated with every trait. Hence the name of an omnigenic model, not just a polygenic model, but an omnigenic model of disease. That basically in these very broad classes, there's you know, a lot of heritability. But you know, even for schizophrenia, you basically end up with stomach and fibroblast and aorta and lung and testis and whole blood, et cetera. So basically a large number of tissues that are continuing to capture heritability for that trait. So this is very weird. If you look at gene ontology categories, again, you find that a huge number of extremely diverse gene ontology categories are enriched for traits that they're seemingly unrelated to. So yes, ion channel activity, calcium ion transport, et cetera, are enriched for schizophrenia, but so is inflammatory response, and so is you know, a huge number of other traits, uh, of, of other pathways. So the model that they're proposing is that early in the GWAS studies, you're gonna find the core set of genes. And as you start going further and further, you're gonna find that, well, this very you know, peripheral pathway that is associated with this other gene, this other gene, this other gene, this other gene, is ultimately also affecting schizophrenia because of the way that I now process my food, which causes me to sort of metabolize that particular neuroreceptor slightly less and so on and so forth, okay? So this concept is that we should be thinking as we find more and more enrichment in GWAS of what is the set of core genes and what is the set of periphery uh, genes. Is everybody with me so far? <laughs> 
And that's basically what leads us to the last concept of today, which is that we can build gene networks from all of these GWAS evidence and then use it to boost the most relevant pathway. So we can learn modules, which can be constitutive and self edge specific. We can go from enhancers to genes and to pathways. We can build these uh, links between these genes and the pathways to the upstream regulators and sort of build that modular structure of disease and start connecting these regulators to now the gene networks that they are affecting across both the core and the periphery of these tissues and basically building these uh, combinations of upstream regulators with a large set of associated genes implicating you know, uh, a set of pathways that is limited at the core but eventually expands to the whole genome. And there's many ways of using this information to now boost your significance and basically simulate random walks across this protein-protein interaction network and label your disease genes that are directly associated and then use that to boost the significance of additional core genes that might be in uh, the periphery. And this PPI network, this protein-protein interaction network, can help identify highly specific genes and pathways for a large number of uh, these traits. And you can validate them based on their connectivity, their density, and their uh, overall risk. And that has basically been used to now sort of pinpoint specific pathways and specific genes that are underlying uh, these disorders. So just to recap, we talked about uh, GWAS now at the systems level. We reviewed GWAS and the challenge of fine mapping given LD and how do we prioritize variants using Bayesian methods. We looked at deep learning methods for GWAS prioritization, both for calling SNPs with deep variant and for prioritizing function. Uh, we looked at EQTLs and mediation by profiling and assessing the intermediate molecular phenotypes that are dependent on these quantitative uh, genetic variants. And then we looked at the overall methodology of these linear mixed models that basically have both a genotype driven effect and a random effect per individual, which captures relatedness and additional information and how we can use that for GWAS and for EQTL calling. We looked at polygenic risk scores of summing over many variants and pruning by LD or actually looking at the independent meta SNPs uh, using the similar value decomposition of SNPs within these loci. We define heritability based on the phenotypic variance divided by the genetic variance and the genetic relatedness. We looked at the problem of missing heritability and various solutions to that problem. And the one that appears to be nominating is a large number of common variants with weak effects but there's also evidence for rare variants that are being captured by these chromosomes and so on and so forth. And we looked at how we can partition heritability by allele frequency, by genomic location, by functional annotations, by epigenomic annotations, by cell type of action, by pathway, and so on and so forth. And then we looked at a very fast way of computing relatedness based on LD score and computing heritability directly. Uh, using this LD score regression by relating this LD score with the overall phenotypic um, uh, variable. And uh, we looked at how we can go to these polygenic and eventually omnigenic disease models where beyond that core of strong effects, you will have a huge periphery potentially encompassing the entire genome and all functional categories. And lastly, we very briefly looked at how gene networks can be used to boost the evidence from GWAS. Who feels that they've learned stuff today? Yes? Good. Awesome. Good. So we'll see you guys on Tuesday. Are there any remaining questions on any of the parts? Um, there's no questions on the chat. And it's 2.29. I'll just one last question. Uh, I'll, we'll, we'll answer that question on Piazza about grading. Awesome. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, see you on Tuesday. Bye.